afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dania Khatib, and I'm your moderator for this session. Uh, we're going to talk about a very important topic, which is security consideration when doing any investment. And I think it's very important because today's world, security and geopolitics as a risk is as important as the business risk, because the business risk does not play out in a void. It plays out in an ecosystem, in an environment that is heavily um, affected by security and political consideration, geopolitical consideration. And in today's world, we see unrest everywhere. We have unrest in Asia, in the Middle East, in South America. We also have protests in emerging market as well as mature market, like we have the Gilets Jaunes in France. And we also have the issue, for example, of terrorism. Terrorism, you have homegrown terrorism, transnational terrorism. Terrorism is even migrating to the virtual sphere. You have cyber terrorism. So all these topics, we, try to, we will try to discuss them in the next half an hour. And we're very lucky because we have three very distinguished speakers who will give us their views and will share with us their experience. I have first, from my left, I have Ms. Sorena Parvalescu. She is a senior partner in Control Risks, and she manages 45 analysts, a group of 45 professionals, and they cover, she covers Middle East, Europe, and Africa. And I have Ms. Kirstine Nelson. Ms. Kirstine is an attorney by profession. She has held many high-profile jobs in the private as well in the public sector, among which Secretary for Homeland Security for the current administration. And, and we have David Young. He is the CEO of Oxford Analytica, which is a geopolitical risk advisory firm. They, and they have clients in the private and in the public sector. And he is himself an expert in international security, in technology, and in emerging markets. So thank you all for being with us today. I will start with Kirsten. Kirsten, what do you think are the most important security consideration an investor, I mean, in general, so should look at when placing an investment? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, and uh, thanks to uh, the host uh, for having us here. So I, I think the way to look at this is to really think about what is risk today. And what I would suggest is that uh, in this hyper-connected world, uh, if you will, where we're all connected through multiple, multiple means, when you look at risk, you have to look at it much more holistically. Mm. So traditionally, of course, you look at physical risk, you look mm. at cyber risk, uh, you look at insider threat, uh, you do vulnerability assessments, understand where your assets are, the services that you provide. You have to do all of that now, but it's made much more complicated uh, by the way in which we're all connected in technology. Uh, so I think you have to look at it, you know, stand back, look at it holistically, and then kind of parse it out into pieces. Okay. David, I want to ask you, I want to mm. finish with, with Kirstine. When you do a um, security risk analysis, what parameter you look at? What parameter you look at? Yeah, so... For a um, certain client. Yeah, so just two opening comments on this, and this kind of reinforces Kirsten's point is, um, firstly, I don't think any investment or any business operation should be um, held in isolation. I think um, one needs to understand that every investment is unique, but it is playing in this hyper-interconnected global ecosystem. And it is imperative, increasingly so today, to be aware of that hyper-connected um, global ecosystem and to be aware that geopolitics, macroeconomics and global social factors mm -hmm. will shape any decision, whether that is a investment decision, a strategic decision, a policy decision, or to do in any way, shape or form with, with operations. From the Oxford Analytica perspective, when we look at um, specific granular uh, parameters, um, we'll start with the industry. I've, I've already said that investments are, are unique. Um, obstacles that organizations face. They may be the same, but depending on the type of company and the mm. industry that that company plays in, uh, those risks will be different. So Facebook versus Shell versus mm. Coca-Cola, the environments within which they play and the obstacles they face are materially different, mm. determining, um, determined by, by their long-term 
strategic objectives. So we start with the industry, we look at their time frame, Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of connects to their, their long-term strategic objectives. And then we, we break that down and look at specific geopolitical risks. So we look at everything from obviously political violence to social mm -hmm. unrest to confiscation mm -hmm. to sovereign default. Um, we then quantify each of those parameters and we have the capabilities now to put actually a dollar value oh, on wow. the political risk exposure that that investment or that business operation will face over that over a 10-year time frame. So it works out if you actually want to look at it from a quantitative perspective. We cover 200 countries. We have 11, we believe there are 11 distinct industries that face geopolitical risk in different ways. And then we define geopolitical risk by five distinct perils. And so if you add that up, you get uh, roughly 15,000 data points. So that is, that is what, we, what we manually do and then we enhance that by additional quantitative data sources. What are the five perils that you... So there's, there's sovereign default conversation, yeah. political violence, uh, and two additional ones, and this is always why I bring my notepad. Uh, <laughs> currency inconvertibility and expropriation. Expropriation. And you'll notice anyone that comes from the insurance business, uh, rather than recreating the wheel, those are the five perils that insurance firms use to ensure political risk. Okay. okay. I want to go to Serena now. Uh, Serena, you once in one of your conferences, you said geopolitical risk is the main disruptor of business in the region, in the Middle East. Why is that? I mean, 20 years ago, we would think that um, oil prices on the global market were the main disruptor. Why do you think now is number one disruptor is geopolitical risk? Yeah, thanks for that, and, and thanks for having me here. So I, I think what we've seen as a change is, I mean, political and geopolitical risks, security and or security risks have been at the top of companies' uh, risk registers for a while now. Um, but I think what's changed in the last few years um, with, with the changes we've seen in the, in the uh, global geopolitics is that uh, the business environments have become more of a foreign policy tool, mm -hmm. um, and this applies globally, but applies very much to the Middle East as well. So mm -hmm. governments, national governments are more inclined to take action that will hurt businesses by, by proxy of the nationality they have. And someone in the China panel was saying how they have a lot of money to invest in the US, but they wouldn't necessarily dare to mm -hmm. invest it there. It makes sense financially, but it doesn't make sense politically. So you see it disrupting business in two major ways. Um, one is on the regulatory front. Um, mm. We've seen an increase in sanctions, trade disputes, of course, mm. um, and uh, national security reviews of investments, um, not just CFUs in the US, but also you see it in Germany, you see it in other countries as well, uh, sort of picking and choosing which investors you're prepared to sell your assets to as a, as a state. Um, and then you see it in data protection and mm. how um, countries regulate data, uh, which they see as an asset as well. But then you see it in the security space and the Iran, Iran um, Gulf tensions are a case in point where we've seen a lot of disruption to business and increase in insurance premiums and cost of doing business from something that is at, at core a geopolitical issue. Okay, thank you. Now I want to move to technology. You know, technology is a double-edged sword. Because of technology advancement, for example, we have state-of-the-art surveillance, so we're less prone to a terrorist attack. Uh, but at the same time, technology advancement allows anyone from his computer, I mean, in his home somewhere, in nowhere, to attack uh, a government service, a server. So this is why we talk about cyber terrorism. So, can, Christine, can you tell me about the advancement in technology and what do they yeah, mean for, sure. for, um, for security for risk? I agree with you. Technology itself is neither good nor bad, right? It can be used for good purposes, yeah. but unfortunately it can also be used uh, by nefarious players. Uh, I think one of the things we're seeing now from both a security perspective, but if you were an investor, what I would encourage you to look at is because of technology as an example, we have this whole question now about what is truth. Right, because technology enables us to have things like deep fakes, uh, enables us to spoof GPS, 
uh, it enables us to change data in a way that is very difficult to go back to good, to understand what the integrity of that data set was. But as a result, if you are basing your risk decisions on predictability uh, or understanding, you can't necessarily be sure that the data on which you're basing those decisions is real anymore. Mm -hmm. right? So technology has enabled us through automation, uh, through machine learning to very quickly go through big data sets, understand mm -hmm. analytics. But at the same time, it has also uh, entered in all of these new vulnerabilities that actually question the reality mm -hmm. of, that, of that very data. You can also look, uh, another example would be quantum computing, for example. Quantum computing will enable us to strengthen things like blockchain to ensure that different transactions and data sets are secure. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that very same technology, that ability to compute at that level will also allow us to attack mm -hmm. blockchain or, or ways in which. So I think when you look at technology, you think of it as a disruptor. Mm -hmm. uh, but in today's age, with the pace of technology, you know, what I always encourage encourage folks to look at is not so much how do you prevent, but to think about how you innovate while under constant attack, because that's kind of where we are today, mm. particularly when we talk about cyber. Uh, but to pretend you can prevent risk, I think, is a, is a misleading uh, statement. I think instead we need to think about mitigation, and then we need to think about resilience and redundancy. You know, how do we ensure that in a, in a, in a region or area or environment of disruption, we can still deliver the core function that we're trying to deliver. Thank you. So, uh, Kristen, you, you spoke about mitigation. I want to take the question to Serena. How can corporation, how can businesses mitigate uh, security risk? What do they do? Yeah, so we, uh, our motto in, in the way we advise companies is to have a threat-led approach. And is irrespective if we're talking about a physical security threat or a cyber threat or whatever threat it is, it's we're organizations with limited resources, so we need to prioritize how we think about our assets. And as Kristen's saying, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when you get hit by one or the other disruption. So the idea is to, to kind of um, identify your critical assets um, and identify what threats those mm -hmm. assets face and then come up with mitigation measures that, that um, that are appropriate for that. And it's, it's in some ways, it's a cost-cutting exercise. We also see, we see a lot of organizations splashing out money on very expensive solutions, whether, again, it's mm -hmm. CCTV cameras or it's mm. um, sort of spy, um, cyber um, software and so on. But then they have um, someone giving away the, the data of the company through a telephone conversation and mm -hmm. sort of the jewel crowns of, of the company. So it's, it's not only about sort of the walls that you build around it. It's about the whole ecosystem being reinforced mm. and about making sure that what matters most to you is where you put the priority. OK. Because David spoke about the ecosystem and the parameters we have to look into the ecosystem. David, I'll, I'll move now to you about the threats, the different threats. Uh, what do you see as most important th security threats or security risk? in emerging market as opposed to uh, mature markets? Um, I think if you, if you look historically, and this is me telling nobody what they don't know, but if you go back 10, 15 years, I think we could all agree that emerging market risk surpassed emerged market risk. And um, both of those surpassed frontier risks, but 10, 20 years ago, we didn't really very well categorize frontier risks. Uh, to be a devil's advocate here, you know, you could arguably say that today emerged market risk potentially surpasses emerging market risks, and those in themselves surpass frontier market risk. So just go through, a, you know, go through a couple of examples. I haven't seen today's the front page of the paper, but I'm pretty certain there's going to be something on there with Brexit. I'm pretty certain there's going to be something in there about U.S. trade and sanctions. Um, and maybe Hong Kong has fallen a couple pages back. But these are emerged market risks that, from the investor standpoint, um, have a significant impact on sustainable long-term performance of those, invest of those investments. Alongside that, you start looking now at emerging market risks. Um, and I mean, I, I don't think there is a better illustration than, than looking at South America um, and, and Central America and looking at what's happening to Bolivia, what's happening to Venezuela, what's happening to Chile. Mm. Uh, from our standpoint, we use the same methodology regardless of the, of the country mm -hmm. or, or the region. Uh, we believe that the, 
um, the academic robustness of, of our methodologies mm. allows the, the risks and opportunities uh, to come to the, fore, the, the forefront. I, also, just one point that somewhat related to this, but I'm a big believer, I'm always the glass is half full type of person, and everyone keeps talking about risks. Uh, there are two sides of the same coin. On, on one side, there are risks, but on the other side, there are An significant opportunity. opportunities. Um, and this may come up later in our discussion, but it will be those organizations and those mindsets that have a sense of agility and speed to change um, that can turn risk into opportunity. They can, they can manage and mitigate risks while looking at identify, uh, identifying and seizing opportunities. So regardless of where we're playing in the world, whether it is emerged markets or emerging markets, from the investor standpoint, from the business strategic standpoint, uh, I'm a big encourager of, of trying to uh, have your cake and, and eat it too. So can you illustrate, you said also we should not look as risk, but also look in the risk lies an opportunity in taking a risk like an opportunity. Can you illustrate in a case, for example, in a concrete example, for example, you mentioned those countries, you mentioned South America. So can you illustrate saying it would be good for investors? Sure. I mean, I think let's take one of the biggest topics at the moment, biggest uncertainty is, which is US-China trade relations and, and where sanctions are hitting. I spend a lot of time with, with clients looking at their supply chains and looking at the agility by which they can maneuver and change their supply chains mm. globally. Uh, the, what will define winners and losers in the decade ahead is this ability to be fluid and agile mm. and adjust to change. I think we're all pretty much aware that um, making calls accurately increasingly is, is more and more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that is to do with US elections or Brexit, yeah. et cetera, very few people are really getting it, um, getting it right. Mm -hmm. uh, we therefore, as a result, break the problems down to the most granular variables and start educating our clients about, okay, here are the drivers, here are the restrainers, and as a result, build um, scenario plans around that to help especially in the, in the private sector, to help multinationals build operational organizations that are quick to adapt and change because they are increasingly living in this hyper-interconnected, mm. unpredictable global ecosystem. And if they do not build organizations that can, can change quickly, not only are they not going to be around, they're not even going to realize that they're not going to be around, they will not have this first mover advantage. So supply chains is, is, a, is a really interesting and fascinating and ongoing conversation that we are having with our clients. You, state, you spoke about interconnectivity. Uh, I'll move to you, Christine, because you worked in the private sector and the public sector. Mm -hmm. Tell me in terms of security risk, uh, what is cooperation do you see between the private sector and the public sector, I mean, from your experience, and what you would like to see? Yeah, so I think it used to be private maybe a couple decades ago from a security perspective. I mean, public-private partnerships have always existed. We know them over generations in the infrastructure world, but we hadn't really seen them in the security world until mm. maybe the last couple decades. And I would suggest that maybe it was nice to have and now it's a must-have because of the hyper-connectivity. So we're very much in a world today where your risk is now my risk. Mm. Right, so as part of my risk management, I have to not only assess and manage my risk, but have to understand yours. And that goes to David's point about supply chain. I mean, third party risk is a great example of this, whether we're talking about the physical supply chain or cyber risk, yeah. uh, but it's a weakest link problem. So really mapping it out and understanding everyone that you're connected to, what is their risk, and then how do you manage that? So by the time you're in that complexity, there is no one entity that has you know, all of the capabilities, authorities, uh, capacity to address mm. that. So you have to have partnerships. Mm. And then when it comes to government, uh, using cyber as an example, uh, if a nation state is attacking your company, it's, it's not yeah. a fair fight, right? So what is that enhanced role of government and how do we now relook at what is the role of government, what is the role of the private sector and who does what best? We know the private sector innovates, generally speaking, better than the public sector. Uh, obviously the private sector cannot regulate, but the public sector is not very good at regulating technology. Mm -hmm. right? It's always behind, and there's lots of inadvertent consequences. So I think that need for the partnership, the awareness, uh, the sharing and understanding of the operational environment uh, is very important. Something we were talking about just before uh, that are popping up in companies is this concept of a fusion center. 
right, whether it's an, an operational fusion center or an intel fusion center, mm -hmm. but a way in which the private sector can work with the public sector daily to take threat information and then understand it within an operational environment. Uh, but I just don't think you can go it alone anymore for all of these reasons. So partnerships are another thing that investors really need to look at when they're looking at a company. Who are the company's partners? Mm -hmm. you know, does it have that ability to raise awareness within government? Uh, mm -hmm. Because of the unintended consequences, I'll give you a quick example. We just had a big uh, spectrum auction in the United States with respect to 5G. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we're trying to move forward with 5G as, in, as is the rest of the world. But one of the unintended consequences is the spectrum that was sold actually will affect weather detecting. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it goes forward, we expect weather forecasts, the accuracy to drop 30%. Mm -hmm. Right, so now if you're in an industry where you care about uh, construction, you care about supply, you care about anything that has to do with the weather, this is a completely unforeseen, unintended consequence, probably in a vertical you weren't tracking if you weren't in the communications. So having those partnerships and really understanding everyone and everything in your environment becomes so much more important today than it ever was before if you want to try to manage your risk. So I'll, I'll ask another question, I mean, to reiterate on what you said. Uh, let's say a company like Facebook, or do you think, for example, there will be sharing of information for security, like, but then if Facebook shares information with the government, then there is a privacy issue. Yeah, it's a fine... Uh, I mean, it's a fine line. It is a fine line. It's when a you fine, speak it's about a fine partnership, dance. yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, foreign interference uh, is probably a good example of that. Uh, in the United States, we worked very closely, at, as did the, the UK and some of the other Five Eyes, with the major social media companies to prevent the spread of violent extremism. Mm. Right, so we worked with them to pull down terrorist content off the mm. internet. Mm. Uh, the EU's been very involved uh, in that as well, as you know. But then you translate into different contexts, which is this concept of fake news, mm. propaganda, foreign interference. Mm. What is the role of social media to pull that down? Mm. And is that, does it pose its own geopolitical risk? Mm. Um, and that's something we're still talking about in the United States. Mm. And, you know, in, in, if you, uh, in the US, you know, it's very um, sacred to have freedom of speech. But where is that line as well if the speech is not real? So what we have been trying to do in the U.S. is encourage the concept of, well, where does the information come from? Hmm. Right? If I read something and you tell me it's written by one of my neighbors, I'll think of it very differently than if it was written by a bot created by a foreign nation. Yeah. Right? So where, what is the source of the information? It's not necessarily changing the information, but hmm. let's help people not be lazy. Let's help people understand where are you getting your news from? What is the source of it? Uh, so that partnership then becomes... Uh, close and needed, but to your last point, where does it trickle over to yeah. government intervention and, and privacy? Yeah, where's right. the And we see that with things like facial recognition, right? There's some parts of the world where governments are using facial recognition to reduce privacy, to reduce citizens' rights, to perhaps put human rights uh, into question. Mm. So again, it's that dual use of technology. But yes, from a partnership perspective, I think you have to be very careful mm. as to how far you go so that you don't impede on privacy. Well, uh, you mentioned terrorism. I, I want to go now to Serena. So how do you evaluate terrorism as a, as, uh, as a risk, as, so, yes. as part of the overall security? So generally speaking, we look at intent and capability when we, when we assess the threat, and we look at the, in, the intent of the actors to enact the threat and the capability they have, which is what they can do and also what they're allowed to do, if you want to sort of in the case of terrorism, security forces capabilities in, in, um, uh, in driving that and so on. And when we think of terrorism as a, as a broad category in, um, in the world of security, we see that having sort of moderated as a threat around the world, uh, partly because the, the intent is still there, um, most likely, and the actors, uh, many of them are still there and reinventing themselves, but the capability of uh, containing some of the threat have increased significantly, and not just in, in the Five Eyes countries and the, and the developed markets, but also in some of the, say, North African countries and um, around the world, there, were, uh, there, was, there was quite a lot of multilateral um, sort of cooperation to, to limit this threat. So, and we see it in, in our conversations with corporates as well, that they, they feel less threatened. It's obviously still a threat, it's a disruption to business, uh, but, <coughs> but businesses feel a bit more um, capable of dealing with it, and so do governments. 
Um, so that, that's, uh, there's no question that there will be steel attacks. And one of the other things we're looking at is that there's more uh, new countries which have attacks. So rather than having sustained campaigns in certain countries, you kind of keep having attacks popping up in countries you didn't expect, which is, which is. I would just jump in on this for one second to say, you know, I think, you know, from my perspective, terrorism has morphed. Right? Yeah. In other yeah. words, now, whether it's um, what the cyber caliphate is, is advertising or others, it's encouraging individuals to do it yourself, right? Yeah. Grab the a knife, wolf. grab a car, yeah. grab, yeah. you know, grab a gun, go kill one person. Uh, it's no longer this concept of we have to have this huge coordinated attack with oh, multiple yeah. consequences. Yeah. It, it's just, so, so anyway, so it's very so different. I think yeah. the threat is different, especially yeah. if you're involved with soft targets, right? You have to be much more concerned in a different way. Yeah, and technology has allowed terrorists to, to communicate and to gather and to organize much quicker than before, mm. much quicker than before. Well, okay, I want to ask you, David, a question. What do you think the pitfalls, I mean, when, when, when you do, uh, you assess security, what, what are the pitfalls? I mean, do you overestimate some kind of, maybe you focus too much on one, on terrorism while you forget yeah, the this, political Yeah, this probably emphasizes some of the themes that I've alluded to, but, but I think the number one pitfall is, um, it's not necessarily an, an inability or an unwillingness, but it is the lack of, of context to, let's look at investments, right? So putting that investment in, in the context of the macro environment, of the geopolitical, macroeconomic, and, and social environment, because the way the world is, is moving today, if you, if you don't do that, no matter how amazing the numbers about your investment may be, if you're not looking at the political, economic, social environment, it really doesn't matter mm. how good the, the P&L of that investment mm. will be over, over a period of years. So that would be point number one. Point number two is making sure you have agility built into that investment strategy or that, or that mm. business initiative. And thirdly, making sure that you actively manage uh, the, the geopolitical, macroeconomic, and social factors that you've identified that can influence that that investment, those, those factors will change over time and you better have your finger on, on the pulse um, of, of what they mean. We do a, a annual political risk survey and I'm, I'm really staggered by the number of multinational organizations that do not actively manage their geopolitical risk around the world despite the fact that they know that geo, geopolitics will and can impact the long-term sustainable performance of their investment. Yet, I think from last year's performance, only 15% of organizations with a billion dollars of revenue or more are actually mm. taking active steps, not just to identify, but on an ongoing forward-looking basis to manage and mitigate risk. So that would be just, I think, my, my biggest encouragement to, to actively manage. Okay, so now we have, we're approaching, we have two minutes and a half. If each one of your, you just tell me very briefly in two sentences, in one minute, what's number one risk, security risk, and number two, if there is a way, I mean, of course, there is not, not no magic formula, but if there is a methodology or like um, a formula, a methodology, let's say, or a roadmap to identify risk. Serena. Uh, so the first, the top risk, I think I, at this point, the top security risk for businesses must be cyber, particularly for mm. countries in the Middle East may sound uh, controversial given that there's a lot of security issues going on in the Middle East, but I actually think, and the Gulf in particular, security, uh, cyber security is the biggest threat to businesses as much as uh, governments. Um, how we assess that, as I said, we, we look at intent and capability and we look at the nature of the business you're talking about. There are formulas that you can work through, but in the end, the purpose, if you think of the ultimate purpose of this is what do you do about it? It was one, one how you track and monitor it to be able to react like David was saying, and second, um, how, what do you do about it? And I think whether you quantify it or you put it on a scale, the idea is that you can have a, an, an agreement on what you do for different types of threats and, and how you react to them.
thing. So priority first. Thing. Uh, I agree, uh, and I'll always, I'll always say cyber top of my list, but you know, I think the bigger threat is not having a methodology that allows you to horizon scan. I think that's mm -hmm. picking up partly on what Dave and I were talking about before, which is simply that the world is changing so quickly. I think there's many organizations that are very prepared for yesterday's threats, yeah. but are not at all prepared for today's threats and certainly not begun to prepare for tomorrow. And that's the delta where you're really going to have a big problem. Okay. Um, in terms yeah. of how to do it, there's lots of methodologies, there's lots of formulas. Yeah. I just think, again, Again, you really need to look at it much more holistically. It's not mm. guns, guards, and gates. Uh, it's everyone that you're connected to. What is the, okay. the quantity of the full risk? David, let's last stay with, word. Yeah, let's stay with cybersecurity, especially with the rollout of 5G. And because I like opportunity, yes, it's the biggest risk area, but I think it is the area that holds the biggest opportunities. And um, yeah, a, a holistic approach, but education, uh, you'll see multinationals now that will have geopolitical risk units, not as, isolation, uh, not as isolated units, but actually it will become part of the DNA all the way from junior associates up to uh, senior board members at the board, because at the end of the day, we are all living in this interconnected, very fluid, very dynamic global ecosystem. And if people don't think that there is a butterfly effect, they, they, their organizations and their investments will, will not perform to the standards and levels that they should. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Join me in applauding our panelists. <laughs>